Okay, welcome back. I've actually grabbed myself a notebook because I think we're going to need to uh, make some notes as we play through the uh, through the game. There's a lot of stuff that kind of gets revealed in the dialogue uh, that you want to jot down as you're playing this. Speaking of dialogue, we need to catch up with Commander Hayes, the Starbase Commander. So I'm going to drift away from the Starbase just so we're out of like, I think there's like a set hitbox. Um, there we go. Uh, we actually have a few options here, but before we before we engage in these, I'm going to ask the commander some questions. I hope the battle fares well, Captain. Uh, yeah, yeah, they've been faring well so far. So we've got some minerals that we actually picked up to offload. And we can see... The more minerals you bring us, Captain, the faster we'll be able to tackle the Urquan. And you'll have seen our resource units have gone up, and you'll have actually seen each individual resource had a different cost ascribed to it. There are more valuable resources, basically. Before proceeding, uh, we're going to ask for some background information. Certainly, Captain. What do you need to know? So let's find out about more about the facilities at the Starbase. We can modify your precursor ship, build additional combat vessels, and supply you with fuel and crew. Okay, and then we can find a bit more detail about each of those things. Our engineers and precursor specialists agree with the scientists from your world that your starship was designed to be a workhorse vehicle, which can be easily reconfigured for different missions by adding or swapping self-contained equipment packs, which we call modules. The modules we can build right now are thruster units, which make your ship move faster, attitude jets, which allow you to rotate the ship more quickly, crew pods, which provide life support facilities for up to 50 additional crew members. Storage bays, which increase your ship's cargo capacity for mineral resources. Fuel tanks, which hold an additional 50 units of fuel. Dynamos, which feed energy into your combat energy batteries, improving your weapon's rate of fire. And last but not least, ion bolt guns, combat weaponry, the exact function of which depends on its location aboard the ship. When put in the first or front module slot, it fires a single shot forward. When put in the second slot, it fires two shots, spread to the left and right of center. When put in the third slot, it fires two shots, directly left and right. And when put in the last or rear slot, it fires a single shot straight backwards. Great. And then we can ask about how, we, how, how are we going to get fuel? This base is designed to serve as hierarchy ships. Fortunately, your flagship uses the same stabilized antimatter technology as hierarchy vessels and will be able to synthesize what you need. However, Due to the size of your ship, we'll have to produce vast quantities of fuel, which will be a substantial drain on our resources. So basically, we can buy fuel from a starbase, and then we can find out how we get additional ships in our fleet, which might be useful. Our shipyard facilities are sophisticated and fully automated, permitting a handful of starbase personnel to do the same job as 500 vac-suited construction workers. However, the only designs that we had in our computers were incomplete hierarchy ship designs. Things looked grim until one of the officers came forward with an amazing story. Even though the Urquan destroyed every Earthling cruiser in the fleet nearly 20 years ago, one of my maintenance engineers was a Starship production assistant at the Detroit shipyard. When Earth was conquered, she was ordered to destroy all ship construction databases. But she secretly made copies of the blueprint disk and then kept them with her ever since. These disks contain all the data we need to build as many Earthling cruisers as you want, provided you, Captain, can supply the large amounts of mineral resources required to build those vessels. In theory, Captain, we could build alien starships here if we had designs for them. However, it's a well-known fact that alien vessels just can't be flown in combat without native starship captains at the helm. So, implication there being if we want to expand our fleet to have ships other than the Earthling cruiser, which has its problems, which we'll get into at some point, I'm sure. Uh, we're going to need to recruit aliens into the cause. Uh, we can ask about additional personnel. We have almost 2,000 highly motivated, skilled professionals aboard this starbase, and every single one of them wants a berth aboard your starship. However, each hand we lose to your ship means less manpower here at the starbase, and this is reflected in the crew RU cost. As long as you don't lose too many crew members to combat or planet exploration, the RU cost will remain static. But we have only so many warm bodies on this star base, and if your needs for crew grow beyond a certain point, the cost could increase dramatically. 
So there, it, it, and there is actually an implemented penalty. If we lose too many crew members, the cost of an individual one will jump up at a certain point. Uh, strictly speaking, it should be limited to 2,000, but apparently the game doesn't actually limit that. So there's a joke on the uh, Ultranomicon wiki about how apparently there's 2,000 skilled, uh, skilled and well-trained uh, workers, highly motivated workers, and then an infinite number of less well-trained, less infinite, uh, less motivated workers. And then, yeah, a little bit of information about the resource allocation system. As you know, Captain, we've committed the entire output of this station to building your flagship and your battle fleet into the strongest force possible. However, our resources are very limited, and we feel you must decide how we are to spend our effort and materials. To aid you in making these decisions, we have implemented a resource allocation scheme. We provide you with a numerical assessment of the station's resources and ascribe a cost to each task we can perform and each device we can build. It's up to you to decide how you're going to spend your resource units, or RU as we call them. To acquire more RU, you must bring resources back to the starbase. These resources can be either in the form of mineral ores gathered from planet surfaces or already refined metals and other valuable materials from the wreckage of enemy starships. There we go. So we can find out a bit more about which resources are most useful. The most straightforward way you can accumulate resource units is to bring mineral ores back to this starbase. There are probably enough resources in just the nearby dozen stars to build your ship into a powerful battleship or to create a strong task force of combat vessels. I would also recommend that you build several additional storage bays. When gathering minerals, focus on cleaning out one star system at a time. This way you minimize the cost of travel through hyperspace. Uh, so yeah, basically we uh, we want to optimize, pick the highest highest quality minerals when we go down to the surface and try and hit as many planets as possible because uh, not only does landing use up your fuel, traveling through hyperspace, which we'll see, also uses up your fuel. Uh, and then we just got some information. You know, you'll have noticed on the lander there was a red bar, which was for minerals. There is also a blue bar, which is for, I think it was DAT for data, uh, which is what we're alluding to here. While I respect your search for abstract knowledge, frankly, Captain, in our present circumstances, I see little use for such data here. Perhaps you can make use of biological information elsewhere. Yeah, so unfortunately, Hayes can't help us with that. Um, we would have to go to a different resource to make a different source to make use of any data we gather there. What else can I tell you? We can then ask. Uh, we've asked about facilities at the starbase. We can ask for some input, and I think. Let's get a little bit of the backstory. So one of the things that's nice is there is a little bar that skims across. So if you're like, I'm not interested in this bit of lore, it's quite easy for you on on, on YouTube to just skip ahead a few, like five or 10 seconds and probably get to the next bit. Um, this is probably gonna be a very dialogue heavy episode, but I think, I think it's important to go through all these points so you get an idea of, of the world and the setting. What aspect of history, Captain? Yeah, so we want to know about what are the other starfaring races. Which group of aliens? And then we can be really specific. Okay, which race? The Shofixti are a race of intelligent marsupials who had been civilized for only a few decades when the war began. They were discovered in the Delta Gorno star system by the Yehat, who adopted and then uplifted the Shofixti, giving them advanced technology and cultural definition. Shofixti are noble and fearless warriors, Captain. In addition, their incredible fecundity and rapid maturation rate kept Alliance ranks solid even at the worst part of the war. You know, I once flew as an observer aboard one of their ships on routine patrol. We never saw the enemy, but I could never stop thinking about the glory device it had strapped to the bottom of its hull. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the find out a bit more about what the glory device is in, uh, specifically. But you'll notice he also actually told us where the homeworld was, so we I've made a note of that because we may need to follow up on it. The Yehat are a race of ancient warrior clans that have been traveling the stars for many centuries. The clans are highly competitive and sometimes even wage war on each other, but the clans are all loyal to the queen and her royal family, known as the Veepzeeps. The Veepzeeps have been in power for over 2,000 years. And it is said that during their rule, the Yehat never lost a battle. There we go. Not giving us some information about where they are, but... I'd like to think I'm not a bigoted person, Captain, especially when it comes to allies, but there's just something about those Arilu that gives me the creeps. One thing I'll say for them, though, they possess some technique for moving really fast through hyperspace. They never let us know what it was, but it sure beats the pants off our fastest ships. 
and we might find out more about that later. Genjesu were leaders of the alliance even though they refused to accept formally the title. I don't know if their silicon-based biology is just plain superior to our old carbon models, or if their fantastic intellect were the product of an ancient, peaceful culture. Whatever the reason, I'd rather be taking orders from a Chinzesu than any other life form, absolutely. One of the more amazing things about them was they never used hyperwave communicators. They could send messages naturally, and their natural hyperwave receptors were much more sensitive than even our best units. We didn't really get much of a chance to learn about those mechanical beings, but I'll tell you what I know. They're the product of a distant, unknown culture who sent a giant factory arc into our region of space many centuries ago. The mother arc, that's what the Earth press called it, turned out millions of robots and finally broke down. I don't know why the Myrnaherm didn't repair the mother arc. Maybe they can't. My personal guess as to why they were sent here is that they're on the leading edge of a colonization project. And once the Myrnaherm obtained enough new worlds, the genuine colonists, whoever they are, will arrive and claim their due. And finally, we have the Sire uh, Sirene that we can ask about. Most raw recruits saw the Sirene as nothing more than uh, warm, breathing pinups. Warm they are, and yes, they do breathe most magnificently, but Captain, they are far more than simple joy units. The history shows the Sirene established and maintained a peaceful culture from their Bronze Age through their discovery of starflight. Before their planet was destroyed in a horrible cataclysm, their world was in Eden. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Sirene are very much a kind of, you can probably tell from the name, very much based in Sirens. Um, that's all of our Alliance members, though. What other group of aliens are you interested in? And let's find out a little bit about the hierarchy we'll be facing off against. Which species? Our enemy is cunning, relentless, and possesses technology superior to all, but perhaps that found aboard your starship. The Urquan are born, live, and die for one purpose only, the subjugation of all other intelligent life in the galaxy. Why? I don't know. They'd probably have an easier time just destroying intelligence, but they're very careful not to use more force than is necessary to achieve their victim's submission. I'd sure like to know what made those wormy bastards as twisted as they are, and I'd like to know why they keep on the move, never stopping longer than it takes to enslave whomever they find. So, Urquan being the leaders of the hierarchy, and then we've got a bunch of other um, potential enemies to deal with. The Mycons are hard to get a handle on. In fact, I'm not sure any human has ever had a real conversation with a Mycon. What we know of them, we've learned from their corpses, which I may add have a nasty habit of coming back to life when thawed out from a decompression quick freeze. Mycon ships seem to expend a significant amount of energy on life support. This is probably because the Mycon only thrive in temperatures close to the melting point of lead. As far as we know, the Mycon are the only race to actively seek out the Urquan in order to become combat slaves. Uh, spathy. Imagine facing a cowardly, mobile clam armed with a howitzer, and you've got a good idea of what it's like dealing with a spathy. Although they tend to avoid battles as much as their masters will allow, once in battle, a spathy eluder is one tough cookie. I once heard a rumor, though I don't like to believe in it myself, that a rogue band of courageous spathy broke away from the main star fleet, painted their ships black with bright red stripes, and formed the Black Spathy Squadron dedicated to performing brave and hostile deeds. Like I said, I'd have to see it to believe it. It's unfortunate that the Umga fell to the Urquan so early in the war because I suspect we would have gotten along well with those big blob creatures. At the very least, it would have been entertaining. We know them a bit better than most races because they were eager to talk with our ships before, after, and during battle. The Arilu intimated that they had a relationship with the Umga before the Urquan arrived, but I don't know any details. When I was flying combat missions along the Corward Front, there was nothing we feared more than the Andraseth Hit and Run Squadron. Their blazer ships were more than a match for our cruisers, so we stayed clear of Ada Volpecule, their home star. In addition, I think each of us aboard the ship knew deep down in our hearts that the Andraseth had a damn good reason for hating us. Our grandparents had kept them as slaves for nearly 50 years. So, uh, another location of notes, Elta Velpe Eta Velpocule. 
I still have nightmares about those spiders taking me prisoner, using me as one of their six sacrifices to Dogar and Kazon, their twin gods of destruction and torment. Those guys were almost as scary as the Anderson to those of us in Deep Space Patrol. Their Avenger ships could appear out of nowhere and melt a cruiser down to slag in seconds. Luckily for us, the bulk of the Ilrath fleet was thrown against the Genjesu and the Myrnaher. And finally, there's the Vux. The Starship Far Voyager under the command of Captain Jeffrey L. Rand encountered the Vux near Beta Mira. Although the details are hazy, it's generally accepted that Rand offended the Vux Starship Commander with an inadvertent insult. Okay, so we also have an idea that the Vux are uh, Beta, Beta Mirai. Beta Mirai. That's enough about the hierarchy. What other group of aliens are you interested in? And then there's finally, are there any others we don't know about? None that we had made formal contact with. The Chen Jesu implied that they had met two other star-faring species, one near the Gikla's constellation and the other directly coreward from Procyon. The Ari Lulalile once mentioned having some fun with an alien race in Draconis, but like so much else with the Ari Lu, they never revealed the whole story. I'm sure there are hundreds more alien races in our galaxy, but beyond what I've told you, your guess is as good as mine. So, we might actually be able to press escape and we can actually, uh, we can see more details there, uh, of... Okay, uh, welcome back. It just wasn't showing this text on my, on my, uh, preview screen, so I just wanted to go back over that and just make sure it was visible to everyone. Yeah, basically, if I press the escape button, it actually gives us a, a recap of what was said, so we want to know about, uh, Corward of Procyon, Procyon, uh, there's an alien uh, race in Draconis, and there was also something near the Gickless constellation, which we may need to look into as well. But yeah. Would you like information on any other aspect of history? Uh, let's find out a bit more about the war against the hierarchy. What about the war? Earth got involved late in the game in 2112 when the Chenjesu arrived in our solar system for the first time. So let's back up a few years to 2098 when the Chenjesu super sensitive receivers detected a strange signal from the Ophiuchi constellation. Though even the Chenjesu didn't know it, it was the first sign of the Urquan's arrival. The Urquan, having detected the presence of many sentient species, were beaming out an exulting hunting cry. The first direct evidence of the Urquan's intent was the sudden conquest of the Umga, a solitary though not unfriendly species in the Orionis constellation. The Jinjesu, distraught by the invasion, were further angered when the Urquan turned their fleets on the hostile but weak Ilrath race. A hastily assembled defense force of Myrna Herman Chenjesu vessels turned the Urquan fleet aside, but the invader moved into spathy space, rapidly subjugating that race. With each new conquest, the Urquan fleet grew larger as it added slave vessels to its ranks. Earth joined the Genzesu to form the Alliance of Free Stars at about the same time as the Androsynth stars fell to the Urquan Armada. Before the ink was dry on our agreement with the Genzesu in 2116, a new race appeared in orbit around the moon and asked for admittance to the Alliance. It was the Arilu Lalile. Timing seemed unusual, and the Arilu were definitely weird, looking like saucer men from Mars, but we were too busy cranking up our mothballed heavy industry that we really didn't pay it much attention at the time. Yeah, so we have some indication of uh, something in the Ophiuchi constellation, and there was also mention of Orianis, which I believe was the home of the Umgar. Spathy space... Umgar Orianis. Fantastic. A bit more during the war. At the start of the war, here on Earth, we were working like crazy, churning out hundreds of heavy cruisers and smaller support vehicles. The Urquan were busy too. Unbeknownst to us, they had moved down towards the Luton Star Group and were attacking the Vux, who only the Yehat knew existed. Our botched first contact with the Vux took place in 2119, and it was the biggest single mistake we made during the war. After defeating the Vux, the Urquan fleets ran smack into the combined might of the Ahot and Show Fixty, supported by the first wave of our cruisers. Again, the Urquan turned away from the hard spot to attack the weak, though we just thought they were running away. In fact, the Urquan had found another independent alien race, the Mykon, in the Brahi constellation. The Mykon's voluntary submission to the Urquan brought the return of the Urquan fleets, now swollen with a hundred devastating Mykon pod ships. 
The last entrance to the conflict were the Sirene, a race of space gypsies who had escaped the hierarchy by moving their vast fleet of slow-moving habitats into human space. With the side set, the last Urquan offensive began. There we go. And then we can ask a bit. So, again, asking through this history, we get a little bit of detail about where various factions might be. The Urquan came roaring through Vux space and tried to push past the Indian Mira star systems. Their onslaught was barely repulsed, and our counterattack made hardly a dent in the hierarchy forces, but we held the line. The Corward Front remained intact. Over the following ten years, there were many great battles between the combined Alliance Starfleet and the Urquan and their hierarchy of battle thralls. Then in 2134, a dramatic shift in the balance of power took place. This must have been about the time the science research mission was sent to the planet of Vela. Our fleets were pushed back from the Indy Mira line beyond Raynet. Holding Rigel caused grievously in Chenjesu forces, and the Urquan, recognizing this weakness, shifted to focus the brunt of their forces on Procyon. That was the last we heard from the Chenjesu and the Murnaher. A few weeks later, waves of ships hit us from all directions. When Ceres Station, our outpost on the asteroid belt, fell to the hierarchy, we knew we were beaten, but we fought on anyway. Three days later, the Urquan vaporized our last remaining laser forts on the moon, and the dreadnoughts took up geosynchronous position above Rome, Moscow, Beijing, Tokyo, London, Buenos Aires, and Washington. We'd lost the war, and we knew it. But the Urquan decided to make it real clear. And that's why if you check any of our most recent maps, you won't find Buenos Aires. I'm from Buenos Aires, and I say kill them all! Yeah! Oh, yeah! There we go. Uh, so we have some hint that there's something happened with the Chenjesu and Menhem in Procyon as well. After the UN submitted their formal surrender, we were given a week to decide the nature of our servitude. The Urquan demanded that the decision be made through popular vote. When all the votes were tallied, Earth had chosen not to fight for the Urquan. We had become a fallow slave world. We were given a month to withdraw all of our people and equipment to Earth. Anyone or anything left off planet would be destroyed after the shield went up. Then the Urquan broadcast an odd message. All objects of human construction more than 500 years old were to be abandoned. We didn't know what the Urquan meant until they moved their dreadnoughts into new orbital positions and opened fire on the surface with their fusion weapons. In seconds, large sections of London, Paris and other European cities were incinerated. At first, we thought they were going to annihilate us after all. And we noticed they were also striking such targets as the Giza Pyramids, the Parthenon in Athens, and Stonehenge. Curiously, the United States was almost untouched. The flaming rain lasted 40 hellish hours. It took days after we crawled from our smoldering shelters to realize what the Urquan had done. Our new masters had targeted every building, monument, or other man-made construction older than 500 years and destroyed it. In those two days, we lost most of the history of mankind. In some cases, the Urquan destroyed places we did not even suspect were significant. From their positions in orbit, the dreadnoughts blew away a kilometer of land in central Iraq, vaporized several targets in the Amazon rainforest, punched a big hole through the Antarctic ice cap to destroy something deep under the surface, and melted a broad swath of the ocean floor in the southeastern Atlantic. Then, just a couple of days later, the shield went up, and our contact with the outside world stopped. The next time I saw the stars was eight years ago, when I was transferred up here to be the new commander of this star base. And there we go, we got a pretty comprehensive briefing. And one thing that's really cool about that is, I'm not going to go into too many specifics, uh, but there are a bunch of that stuff is not actually answered in this game. Um, and the thing that's potentially cool about that is there is actually a sequel to this game specifically in development. Um, the original creators of the game don't have the like, the trademark to the title, so the name would have to be a little bit different, but they are they, they have the rights. And I think it's all been agreed. There was some legal, some legal back and forth about it with a different company as well. Um, and they, I think it was determined, they have the rights to like the, the specific factions, but they don't have the rights to the title. So a different company gets to make star control games, uh, but Pist I think it's Pistol Shrimp they've named themselves. Uh, they were formerly to Toys for Bob, or maybe they 
are no longer talking. I don't know the exact details of the companies, but yeah, they're actually making a sequel to this, so maybe we'll get answers to some of the questions that don't get answered in this game. That would be interesting. Would you like any information on any other aspect of history? And I think just ancient galactic history is the last thing we've got. We have some data on this subject. What do you want to know about? Hell, you probably know more about them than I do, but here it goes. About 200,000 years ago, when our great to the nth grandparents were just starting to play with stone knives and bearskins, a star-faring species suddenly appeared on the galactic scene and spread like wildfire. We found evidence of their presence just about everywhere, from an orbital platform on Alpha Centauri to a stack of data plates in a cave on Pluto to some nameless widget found in a voodoo shop in New Orleans. Though we never found a precursor body or even a picture of one, we can conjecture what they look like by examining the scale and layout of their equipment. Such an analysis indicates they were giants, say five to eight meters tall and twice as wide. I don't know if they looked more like a brontosaur or an elephant. Anyway, about 3,000 years after the precursors made their dramatic appearance, they vanished. Poof! As far as we can tell, it took less than a decade to happen. And uh, we can ask about this in any of uh, any other races from the ancient past and any indication that aliens might have visited Earth. So we'll ask those two. You mean besides the precursors? Well, the only information we have is second-hand based on some research by a Chenzesu historian that I read at the Academy. Zedsert Sack, the historian, found some evidence that there was a group of alien races who formed an interstellar empire not too far from here about 22,000 years ago. The only species in this empire who actually lived in our region of space was a race of rock-like creatures who lived in the Volpeculae constellation. The presence of the hostile androsynth in that part of space severely limited Sitzertzak's research. He never even found out the race's name. So another hint we should probably head towards the uh, Volpeculae system. Yes, there is. Aside from the precursor relics we have found on Earth, often in museums mislabeled as modern art, we've discovered disturbing evidence of much more recent visitation. Perhaps you're already aware that during the mid to late 20th century, there were unaccountable UFO sightings as well as dozens of reported encounters with alien life forms. Although we can discount many of the reports as wishful fabrication or traumatic translation, the military authorities of the time kept a secret record of the incidents which were legitimate. In each such case, the aliens are almost identical in appearance. They have white skin and minimal facial features except for huge almond-shaped eyes which are often described as glowing or luminescent. This description fits almost perfectly the Arielu Lali Lay. In most of the legitimate encounters, the people involved describe being physically examined or modified by the alien. In some cases, unusual pregnancies occurred, and in almost every instance, there were repeat visitations as though the Arielu Lali Lay were doing checkups on their subjects. We never got the chance to confront the Arielu Lali Lay about what they did to us and why. I wonder if we ever will. There we go. Would you like information on any other aspect of history? And I think we've covered all of the, all of the potential topics. Sure. Anything else? Uh, so, let's get some input on how to defeat the Urquan. Can you be more specific? If you have the patience, I would recommend you spend several months or even a year gathering mineral resources. You can find such minerals on almost any planet's surface, but the quality and density will vary depending upon the type of planet you're on. Base metals are probably the most common materials you'll find, but they aren't particularly valuable. You can find rarer precious and radioactive elements on metal-rich worlds such as Mercury. An old miner once told me that you could tell the relative quality of a planet's minerals based on the planet's color as seen from space. Remember the color sequence from good to bad, the miner had a mnemonic that went something like very young orangutan could grow bananas perhaps rather well. It is also the case that mineral yields will be better at hotter stars. Temperature is related to the size and color of a star. Red stars are the coolest, then orange, yellow, green, blue, and the hottest stars are white. There we go. So I'm actually going to go back so uh, people can see that, but basically uh yeah so uh very young or uh, very young orangutans could grow bananas perhaps rather well so uh that's presumably violet yellow orange uh see cyan uh green blue 
purple, uh, red and white uh, for the planet color. And then we need to consider hotter stars will have better mineral yields. So red stars are the coolest. So red, orange ascending through the alphabet, basically. Uh, I believe red, orange, yellow, green and blue sort of ascending through the alphabet, uh, which is actually kind of kind of how uh, star temperature does work. Hottest stars are white. Um, obviously, that's a kind of crude representation. But yeah, basically, as you shift up through the electromagnetic spectrum, the stars are stars are much hotter, um, sort of proportionally speaking. The planet colour thing is just pure game mechanics. Um, and obviously, there's very few green stars because a star that has its output in the green will also be putting out a lot of the other parts of the AM spectrum. So kind of like our sun. Our sun technically is um, has a peak in the green kind of part of the spectrum, but because it's also giving out a lot of yellow light, a lot of red light, a lot of orange white, it's kind of an orangey, uh, it's kind of an orangey white colour. Obviously, pro tip for the day, do not stare at the sun. That all depends on whom you meet, doesn't it, Captain? Well, in all seriousness, if you encounter the Illrath, Bucks, Androsynth, or other hierarchy battle thralls, I wouldn't hold out much hope for a peaceful encounter. So if you feel you have the advantage, attack. The resources you will scavenge from the enemy's wreckage are well worth the effort. If you can find Alliance races who are in a position to help us, then you must convince them to join with us. Their assistance may be crucial to our success. Hmm, let's see. You need to build up and balance the strength of your flagship. I would add thrusters up to, say, five or six. Speed is essential in combat, but it would also pay off over the long haul in hyperspace. And if you prefer to avoid confrontation, nothing beats a great pair of legs. I would add turning jets for increased maneuverability. I would add enough weapons to defend yourself if you're caught without escort ships. You need additional fuel, at least 50 units. Your weapons will be underpowered in combat if you don't have at least one dynamo. I guess I'd gather more minerals to build up a good supply of resource units. Okay, so some priorities there. Let's get a bunch of thrusters, some jets, and the more we can afford the better. Some weapons, uh, just just in case. Uh, plenty of fuel, and some and at least one dynamo. We'll see how, what we can afford when we go to the starbase. Captain, I wish I had an easy answer, but I don't. The only way I can see of liberating Earth as well as the Alliance allies is to destroy the Urquan and their armada of battle thralls entirely. Do we have any long-range plans? To defeat our enemies, we will need awesome strength, both in your flagship and the fleet, as well as the assistance of powerful new allies. Though combat will be unavoidable and sometimes necessary to achieve our goals, I'm certain your wits will be at least as important as your weapons. You'll need to explore this region of space, gathering resources and information wherever you go. And there we go. Um... I don't know, Captain, but I suspect their battle thralls know more than we do, so I suggest you try to gather information from them, perhaps by force. At first, your ship will be far too vulnerable to permit frontal assaults on the Urquan. Even when your ship is at full power, we're faced with the reality that the hierarchy has thousands of ships. You cannot win the fight alone, Captain. You need allies. Also, towards the end of the war, when the hierarchy broke through the Corward Front, we heard rumors that the Urquan had unleashed some kind of super weapon which was unstoppable by normal means. You need to find out if that rumor was true, Captain, because if the Urquan do have such a weapon, we'll have to find some way to stop it or all our efforts are for naught. And we've got a couple more questions. If you encounter an unknown alien race, proceed carefully and diplomatically. We need all the friends we can get, and we certainly can't afford any more enemies. Remember, Captain, with your precursor starship, you hold awesome power. But there will be situations when dealing with an alien race where a carrot will serve better than a stick. But first, you must determine what carrot the alien wants. And is it her fastest way to build up strength? You need to accumulate enough resources so we can build up your flagship and assemble a strong fleet. I'd also recommend that you acquire blueprints for other more powerful ships than our trusty cruiser. I suspect that aliens will not give you such prints unless you form an alliance with them. Okay, so... What else can we discuss? I think... What else can I tell you? That is pretty much everything that we have exhausted. Can you... It's just... Yeah, yeah, we've asked all of those questions. What else can I tell you? 
So I am actually going to call it there. What I'm going to do uh, retroactively <laughs> advising, I'm going to put some chapters in. So if there's bits you want to skip, I think this is probably going to be a video that like you're either going to want to sit and watch all of it or you're going to want to skip. I might also clip in little bits where like the little bit of information about how the sun spectrum works uh, might flag that up. But yeah. I'll probably, I would probably give this a title along the lines of 1A rather than episode 2 because I'm going to be honest, not much has happened here, but I want you to have the opportunity to uh, watch, to sit through the dialogue and, and get through some of the information. So with that, uh, I hope you've had a good day. I hope you've enjoyed this if you've sat through the entire thing and I will hopefully see you again soon.